So we sent it back to the repair shop again, and uh, this time um, they replaced the bearings, gave it a paint job, and sent it back. So the next question was, how are they testing the rotor bars at the repair shop? Well, the normal method is something called a growler. A growler is half a transformer. You place the rotor on it. You energize it. And then you might take uh, either magnetic tape or, more commonly, you'll take um, metal filings. And you will go across each bar looking to see if the bar is weak or if, um, if you don't see any magnetic field around a particular bar. Uh, other methods include single phasing the motor at 10% of the voltage, uh, putting a clamp on ammeter on it, rotating the shaft slowly, and seeing what the impact is. Shouldn't be any more than 3 amps difference, or 3% difference as you go around. Um, die testing, there's, there's a number of ways of testing. The answer we received was that they did a visual inspection of the rotor. So uh, we had it uh, sent up to another remote repair shop who did do a growler test and were able to successfully identify two broken rotor bars. Now, how common are rotor bar issues? If you're primarily dealing with machines under 600 volts that are not being started and stopped often, rotor bar problems are not that common. If you're dealing with uh, medium voltage, means over 600 volts, up to 6.6 .6 kV, and you can include 13.2 kV motors. But if you're dealing with those machines, uh, normally those are only allowed um, one uh, cold and two hot starts in a day, uh, sometimes less. I've actually seen a machine that was allowed one start in three months. <laughs> Mind you, it was very, very large. Um, but in any case, uh, with uh, in, in large uh, manufacturing locations, petrochemical, power plants, and so on that have a lot of medium voltage equipment, uh, rotor bar issues can be far more common. Any questions so far? Okay. I'm going to show you a couple of quick slides here. This is a particular issue I've dealt with recently on a uh well I believe it was an eight hundred yes, it was an eight hundred horsepower uh eighteen hundred RPM machine. Now these particular machines are located uh approximately uh eighty feet uh in the air and uh we had to test them from the ground floor and uh we had to take the data because there were forty one sixty volt machines from the back of the, uh, from the CTs. So the uh, arrows in this particular picture are pointing to the back of the current um, indicators, the analog current meters on the face of the control. What we did is we attached um, a clamp, uh, the, the, uh, the instrument CT to each one of these, um, uh, each one of these and took our data. So the data I'll show you will only have current only, no voltage. Uh, the first machine had failed, and when we took it apart, we noticed a few things. Uh, for instance, the oil water line uh, is all the way up to the winding. Uh, at this point, most of the oil has been drained away. Another thing I'd like you to note um, is that between the stator core and all the way out to the end turns of the stator, um, I have a fair amount of distance. There's also not much blocking in here. And in a medium voltage motor of this size, you have something called a surge ring, which is a rope that goes around to keep, reduce the flexion of the uh, end turns as the motor's running and as it starts up. Because whenever you start up and you have that high current, the windings want to throw themselves at the rotor. So you have all that there in order to reduce the amount of mechanical stress in the motor. Uh, for a motor this size, with end turns this long, and this is, uh, if I remember right, this is about 15 inches, um, I would have expected, as a rewinder, um, I would have expected to see a lot more blocking than this and more than one surge ring. I only had a little bit of blocking and one surge ring. Now, in this picture, you can see what the blocking looks like. Those are each folds of electrical insulation tucked between the coils. 
well, with that much distance, I should have seen far more of, of that. Usually in, in, well, this length I would have put it one close to the knuckle coming out, one in the middle and one towards the end in order to keep the uh, coils from coming very close to each other. So if they come too close, they'll short if the insulation system is wearing out. Okay, that's the machine. Let's take a look at the data. Now, the one that failed was replaced with another one. That'll be number four. We'll go back to that in a minute. Let's take a look at combustion fan number three, which failed approximately one week later uh, on a startup. And I'm going to go through one more thing while I'm in here. Uh, this is the current draw during operation. Uh, this is, of course, an 800 horsepower, 1785 RPM, 4160, 100 amp motor. Uh, we were able to, with that first one that failed, actually count the number of rotor bars, which were 58, and the number of stator slots, which were 72. I highly recommend, if you are doing um, this type of analysis, if you are uh, going through doing, um, uh, doing electrical signature analysis, that as part of your repair practice, if you have a if you have a um, uh, report coming back from your motor repair facility, that you request the number of rotor bars and stator slots. If you do not go this direction and you have um, information, uh, I'm sorry, and you have a vibration program in place, you still want to know the number of rotor bars and stator slots. A lot of what we're looking at here is very, very similar to what a vibration analyst uh, looks at. Okay, so I'm going to focus in here. Next thing I'm going to point out, there's my lag frequency. You can see there's very little uh, in the way of peaks down here. Um, there are some sidebands based on running speed. Um, it, it has selected a running speed. Um, there is a small pull pass frequency. There's these two peaks all the way to the left, one about 5 hertz and one about 10 hertz. I normally see, uh, this is a fan application, I normally see pump impeller-related issues and fan-related issues uh, in that range. How to calculate that? Don't think anybody's figured that out yet. We're still working on it. Okay, so I have this data. This data here includes the line frequency. This one down here, you can see it's called spectra demod. Demodulated spectrum means that the line frequency, there's a very large frequency that you see in the middle one, is now gone. That's taken out of the picture. So that all of the other peaks now show up a little nicer. And what will show up here as peaks will show up here as sidebands. Okay? Down here I can take a look at things like if I have a peak growing around my running speed, that peak growing at my running speed would indicate misalignment or unbalance. However, in this particular machine, we're going to focus on something a little bit different. high frequency data. Uh, if you're doing electrical signature as well, uh, it's nice to see three waveforms just to know what things look like. And this is the three voltage waveforms across 0 0.05 seconds. Um, if your software allows, you want to get rid of that though for doing analysis. You only want to look at one phase. Okay, so let's drop that out. This is a spectrum out to 6,000 hertz. This is the high frequency spectrum. You can see that there's a lot of noise there. A lot of this noise is directly related to power harmonics. Anything related to power harmonics, you can ignore. What I'm going to do is we're going to take a look at stator mechanical. So I have 58 Stator, uh, I'm sorry, I have, uh, sorry, 72, pardon me, 72 stator slots. And I'm running at an RPM, 